All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming and actually staying late. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is awesome. I'm grateful that you're here. Um, my name is Rich Yule. I'm an enterprise solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. Um, this is actually kind of a, a little bit surreal. So I started working with AWS in uh, 2010. And my first AWS summit I attended was in 2011 uh, in, in New York City. And uh, now I find myself here uh, presenting to you. So I'm grateful and uh, honored to be here. With that, um, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. But I, I wanted to show you guys just quickly a picture that I uh, took this morning. I uh, thought that was a beautiful sunrise, and uh, I, I love the visual imagery of that, just the uh, bridge to the cloud, right? Uh, and, and really, uh, <laughs> the message that's inside of the picture, Miha's not getting it, but um, we'll go ahead and, and move forward. Today with our uh, a session, we're going to go over um, a few things, but I want to set the context up front. Uh, this session is about on-premises disaster recovery using AWS. We're not talking about disaster recovery of resources in AWS to AWS, uh, but we're focusing more of the on-prem resources into, into um, Amazon Web Services. We're going to kind of talk through that. We'll go through some of the scenarios. Towards the end, I have a, a QA panel that I've lined up uh, some, some friends and, and um, some of the, the best tech talent that I know uh, to come up and, and share the stage and, and open up the forum um, to you guys to ask some questions. And uh, whether or not you've noticed or not, there is a $1,000 giveaway that we're going to be doing at the end in service credits. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, part of the panel, you'll actually have to ask a question um, to be eligible for that. There will be uh, um, a discussion and, and some engagement with a partner to help uh, you realize that. But worth sticking around, worth engaging, thinking about a question, uh, a scenario in disaster recovery, and, uh, and taking $1,000. So uh, in service credits, we'd be, we'd be happy and honored to do that today. So that's, that's kind of what we have on... Uh, on the schedule today, so we'll go ahead and uh, dive in a little bit further. Um, to kind of clarify things up front as far as terminology goes, um, I want to also specify that this session is not going to be focusing on business continuity. We're going to focus on disaster recovery, which is a piece of business continuity, um, but disaster recovery being the technology or the technical aspects of, of the infrastructure and systems uh, as part of business continuity. We will talk uh, in just a minute about uh, RPO and RTO and what they are, and I'll um, I'm going to go through an example and kind of tell you what they are here in, the, in just a second. Um, a lot of people that I work with and in, in, in many technology spaces um, struggle with uh, what RTO and RPO are. And so I wanted to share a story, an example. Uh, I have a friend who is a business owner. His uh, company currently employs somewhere around a couple thousand people, I believe, in, in three or four different countries, uh, including the U.S. Uh, as well. And his company, in the very beginnings, um, he had a, uh, a building, an office, and they had a data center. And in, in this uh, scenario, my friend, um, he had two or three employees, and one of them was his IT guy. And his IT guy took a tape home, uh, which wasn't actually a traditional practice, which I think is, is, is kind of silly, but this was a while ago. He took a tape home, and two days later, the office uh, burned down, and the data center attached to the office burned down. Uh, and, and they were kind of um, worried and concerned whether or not they were actually going to be able to move forward and do business. It had all their code and, and essentially everything from their business. So they worked with their vendor. Um, at the time, I believe it was HP, to get some new equipment. It took them about two days, uh, one to two days, to get, to get replacement equipment. And then the time it took them to restore that um, tape backup. So in this case, uh, the two days uh, would be the RPO because his backup was two days old, uh, and his RTO was about two days as well, right? So his RPO would be two days because that's how much data he lost, right? That tape that he had was the transactions and, and the data that he lost. Uh, and then as far as how long it took him to return uh, to the point in which he was before was, was uh, as well two days. So uh, his RPO being that, that two-day tape um, and then his RTO being two days to get that equipment from them. So hopefully that kind of clarifies what RTO and RPO are as we kind of talk through um, these scenarios we're going to dive into. With that said, I, I want to clarify also that uh, as you think about disasters, uh, don't just think about that scenario that, that happened to my friend and his company, right? Like, don't think about just a building fire. Uh, don't think about natural disasters. But you need to be planning for other types of disasters, uh, the types of disasters that don't traditionally um, get thought of or make news headlines, right? Um, corrupt data, for example, right? 
If you have a, a highly available system with corrupt data behind the scenes, uh, that is definitely uh, a disaster, right? Uh, as you think about that, you also need to be thinking about people and processes, uh, securing and keeping your data um, secure from employees or malicious attack. Uh, these are the types of things that, that a lot of times people don't think about uh, when they're planning for disaster and disaster recovery. So uh, think outside of the box on, on these things as you start to plan and, and put things together for disaster recovery. Um, I want to kind of talk through the, the transition of, of DR. I mentioned uh, I started working with AWS in 2010. Before that, I worked for a very large uh, firm uh, and, and did disaster recovery um, and, and did IT implementations, architecture, design, all of that for systems that were dis uh, distributed around the, the globe. Uh, and with that came these backup disaster recovery data centers. Uh, and in my experience, a lot of times what I found was that these backup disaster recovery uh, data centers that were located, you know, X number of miles from the primary data center, uh, you know, separate floodplains, all the different things that you have in a DR data center. When we would go through to do tests, they would, they would most frequently, they would fail, right? We, we wouldn't actually be able to complete the exercise. We'd identify some area where technical debt was so high that it actually caused us uh, a challenge and we weren't able to do that. Um, additionally, um, those types of exercises and things become extremely costly, um, and, and building and maintaining those become very costly. So as you kind of think about that and transitioning from that world and, and look at the, the conventional disaster recovery model, it's very high cost, right? It, it costs a lot of money to build out a, a backup data center. Even if you're just in a colo, uh, it, it's, there's still quite a bit of cost that come from that. Um, it costs a lot of money to run them, to maintain them, uh, to operate them. And it becomes very difficult um, to go through and update and, and cycle through them. One of the other things that is a, a very common challenge and was for us was if you had div different business units or you have different customers that you're serving and you have one single DR data center, you really have a single failover path. So one customer could have corrupt data and need to fail over, uh, where another customer may not. Uh, and, and so there has to be a balancing act of do we fail all of our customers because they're shared infrastructure uh, and, and really kind of get into those more complex scenarios. And if you contrast that in those traditional disaster recovery scenarios and you look at, at really the AWS model, you can get out of these high capex uh, environments where you have to spend a lot of money up front. You can get out of the environments where you're having to maintain and run them uh, long term. And, and you get a consistent environment uh, across that. A lot of the things that we're gonna talk about too is, is you have the ability to automate and, and do recovery automation um, through development and, and coding. Uh, and, and you can individually, in contrast, have a separate level of disaster recovery for a different application. So if you have a core business app that needs a lower RTO and RPO, you have the ability to have that with Amazon Web Services um, where you're not so closely tied on it. This is my entire data center. I could have just one uh, application that has a much lower RTO and RPO, and we'll kind of talk through these applications as we dive in. With that, I want to show you guys this topology map. So uh, one of the things that I did when I started working with Amazon Web Services is I, I listed out like all the tools and technologies that we had and, and were using and what would those technologies and tools map to in Amazon Web Services. And this is no different when you're doing disaster recovery. You really need to be thinking about and planning for what are the types of technologies and services I need to fail over. I need to fail over from my traditional data center and move them into Amazon Web Services. So for example, DNS being Route 53 or your load balance going into either elastic load balancing or, or an appliance, uh, depending upon your application requirements. Thinking about using our, our services like auto scaling um, to help apply and, and keep costs low. Uh, as you kind of move through that, one of the big things that's also important uh, is that you're, you're thinking about DR data centers, and in reality, our availability zones uh, really map very closely to that, right? They have a lot of the same requirements, and, and if you use availability zones, you don't have to have those multiple data centers. You, you get that out of the gate with Amazon Web Services. You're running in different availability zones, which technically are different data centers. So we're going to talk through these ascending levels. There's a disaster recovery white paper. There was a question uh, on that if there's uh, some documentation on this. But these are actually the same levels that we're going to talk through in, in the disaster recovery white paper from Amazon Web Services. Let's start with the backup and restore scenario. 
This is kind of the very first entry level into disaster recovery on AWS. This is where you back up your on-prem data into Amazon Web Services. This is suitable for something that you can have a higher RTO and RPO, something that is more in the range of days instead of, of hours. Um, from a, a cost perspective, this is a very low cost option, right? You can do these for very cheap, very cost effectively. Um, so it's a great entry point. If you don't have any disaster recovery today, uh, then you really need to be looking at a minimum at this backup and restore option. And we'll talk a little bit more in, in depth on that. But this should be a at a minimum, the entry point for your business. Pilot light. So as we kind of ascend up the level, you can see the RPO and the RTOs descending, but the cost starting to go up. Uh, pilot light is where you're actually replicating data into Amazon Web Services, and you're running minimal infrastructure um, just to take, uh, take over and, and to be ready to spin up and, and to have provisioned in a very quick cycle. Ascending up from there, you've got our, our hot standby option, which is, again, you're still replicating services into Amazon Web Services, but you already have uh, application servers and web servers and infrastructure running, ready to go, uh, and, and ready to take over load in, in a moment's notice. The hot standby is a, a great option as an intermediary uh, as you go into the multi-site uh, scenarios we're going to talk about here. But multi-site being this you know, replicated load balance configuration, they're both actively taking production workloads. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, this is something, and, and they're, they're listed in an ascending order for a reason. Uh, to be honest, I personally, in, in my work experience, I would not start out with a multi-site if, if you uh, are running in an on-prem. I would start doing something like a pilot light or backup and restore, get that working, uh, get those pieces in place, then ascend to the next level, right, and figure out what pieces you do and, and don't know about and how to make the solution better. As you do this, this is where business continuity comes in. And I said, and I'm, I'm still on this, we're not going to talk more about business continuity, but I, would, I do want to state that as you begin in the pilot light and move to multi-site, you're moving into that space of business continuity, right? You're moving into solving business problems uh, instead of um, just solving technology problems. So this is a, a slide that shows the Amazon Web Services that we have that actually will start to map in and play as you ascend these levels, right? So you can see in Backup and Restore, you start using our services like Storage Gateway, uh, Glacier, uh, Amazon's uh, Simple Storage Service, or S3, our Route 53 DNS service, so that if you have a failover, an issue, you need to uh, fail over to a, you know, another site, you have the ability to do that. Um, connectivity, you're, you're looking at the space of, of VPN. And so this kind of shows that evolution. As you step over into Pilot Light, you should start using our automation and deployment tools like CloudFormation uh, and, and EC2. You should have EC2 running instances in a Pilot Light scenario. Um, your EBS volumes would start coming into play, right? Because you're going to have machines that are running. And, and you may want to start looking into the Direct Connect. You may want to have a dedicated hard line into Amazon Web Services where you're replicating and establishing data. Again, as you move um, more to the right on that hot standby side, you really want to be thinking about identity and access management. You shouldn't just be running in a, a mode where you're um, doing minimal uh, infrastructure and operations. You should really be investing in, I want to make this a, a key part of my business. Uh, I'm not just going to put the infrastructure out there that's a minimal space. You should be investing in and in setting up things uh, with federation to whatever your directory and identity provider is. As you move in, you should also start leveraging with hot standby things like auto scaling and elastic load balancing um, and, and, and start looking at the multiple direct connects. Connectivity being the, the biggest um, and most fundamental piece across all of these. And then obviously as you move into multi-site, it, you know, it opens up to whatever services that Amazon Web Services has. Uh, obviously you could use any of these services in your scenario, but, but really you should start taking advantage of, the, of all of the services Amazon has to offer as you move into this multi-site configuration. With that, let's go into a, a backup and restore architecture diagram just to kind of show you what these ascending levels look like. Um, just to clarify, the application I'm going to talk through is a simple, very simple, stateless application. Um, so the web servers, the app servers, uh, they, they have stateless type information. Uh, at a minimum, we'd be backing up logs or very simple configuration details. Uh, from the database server, uh, and everything in this scenario will be open source. So um, as we kind of talk through some of the costs that are associated with this, I want to clarify that this is a open source uh, model, right? So all of the technologies and, and pieces that you've seen here from a cost standpoint are involved. 
uh, are low cost. So as you look at this, you can see storage gateway and, and replicating data from either a, a backup system, uh, be it net backup or whatever your, your backup provider is, into Amazon S3, and then archived off into our uh, Glacier archiving system. With that, I want to show the, the costs, right, to, to really enable and show that, that there's value to the business. Um, you know, in this sample application, which is a single terabyte database um, with up to a terabyte of, of other data, um, you can kind of see the costs in, in what it actually can be done. So in this scenario, approximately $200 a month, uh, you can be backing up and having a, for this type of application, a very simple scenario. Not very expensive when you're, when you're working in this kind of scenario. So there's really not a good reason not to be doing something if you have a simple application that, that fits into this space. Um, one of the other things that I want to clarify on, um, backup and restore is suitable, and we've, I've heard conversations and discussions today about technical debt. If you have a higher level of threshold for technical debt, uh, if you're a small shop or um, you're in a space where you just don't have the ability or resources to automate, um, backup and restore is a great option for that. It's also great for low costs, uh, and your, your costs uh, are very low to enter into this space. Um, there's existing investments um, that you can leverage in, in deduplication, compression, and, and WAN acceleration. And one of those options is, is Riverbed. Uh, and I know many enterprises today have Riverbed appliances in that. It's a very popular DR storage appliance that's out there, uh, which actually does the deduplication, encryption, and optimization of, of uh, storage that's actually back-ended onto S3. With this, you can take this costs, uh, the cost of these services down to a terabyte a month. Um, which is, is ridiculous. As you go over the life cycle of three years, they start to enter this phase where you get a 30 to 1 uh, reduction in deduplication and compression, uh, which is, is phenomenal. Um, so really something worth looking at. There's a lot of other uh, vendors in this space as well, but I just wanted to kind of highlight Riverbed as one of these technologies that's out there and, and available for you to look at. Let's take a uh, look at the pilot light. So this is, again, ascending the level. You're starting to do replication. This is the same simple application, right? You have Route 53 sitting in here ready to take over load and, and traffic uh, or to redirect traffic. Um, but you've got uh, your database, which is now being replicated over Direct Connect. Uh, you've got the application um, tiers sitting over on your primary active on-prem uh, site and uh, ready to take uh, load over on the pilot light side. Now, as you kind of were to think about a, a failover scenario, you'd leverage things like cloud formation to automate the provisioning of your elastic load balancer resources, your application servers, uh, and have those cloud formation templates ready to go uh, and, and ready to spin up those resources in a moment's notice. As we kind of look at the costs of this, monthly, uh, you can kind of see we start adding in the cost for Route 53. You've got your, your ELB and all these other services that won't cost you anything because they're not actually provisioned and they're not actually running. Uh, so your cost for that being low. I do want to clarify also on this slide that Direct Connect uh, and the cost for Direct Connect can vary wildly, uh, depending upon if you have anywhere from like a 50 meg line all the way up to 10 gig lines or multiple 10 gig lines. So I didn't try and include the costs of, of what that is in here because they could range uh, up into ten, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars depending upon how big of a pipe you put in between uh, your on-prem data center and, and Amazon Web Services. But this kind of gives you a, a feel as you start to ascend up this, um, this level or ladder of disaster recovery, all of the different technologies that are in play, as well as the costs uh, to do these types of things. OK, so on the, the pilot light, um, I wanted to clarify, there are a couple of technologies and, and providers that are out there, um, Cloud Endure, Racimi, and there's a, there's a series of other ones. Um, they, the pilot light scenario is great and, and suitable for when you need a lower RTO and RPO. Uh, you're not fully into an automated space, um, but you do have a higher business critical nature and you really need to be making an investment in that direction. It is more of your mid-range cost DR, so it's not going to be a, a very simple, low cost from a backup and restore standpoint, uh, but it gives you a great option uh, as far as you know, the ability to be flexible and, and to move forward quickly. All right, so with that, let's talk about our warm standby. Warm standby, as you can see uh, from this diagram, we already have elastic load balancers. We have a single web server, a single app server sitting, uh, provisioned, running, waiting to take uh, load and activity if there's in the event of a failover. You can see we've, again, used cloud formation to provision and, and spin up these resources. And you have that same direct connect line, and you're doing database replication uh, from the on-prem site to your Amazon Web Services availability zone and, and region. 
uh, as we take a look at this one, you can kind of see the costs again, right? So you're starting to incur additional costs because you're actually running active uh, nodes, you're running active web servers, you're running uh, active app servers. And while I say active, that means that they're on. They're not taking load, but they are running, they're provisioned, they're ready to go. Uh, but you can see that, that your RTO and RPO are going to come down significantly because they're ready to go. They're already provisioned and you already have these resources up and running. Okay, so let's talk about this last one. This is the last step, the last ascension in, in this level of DR. You've got this multi-site architecture. Um, and, and as you look at this multi-site architecture, you can see you're running full web servers, you're running full app servers on both sides. Uh, you've got both or multi-direction database replication going between these nodes. You have Route 53 front-ending and doing the, the load balancing of, of where it's sending traffic um, based upon a number of factors. And you're really running and using Amazon Web Services. So the, in the event of a failover, your RPO and your RTOs are in the space of minutes. Right? This is a, a highly optimized model uh, and something that, you know, um, when you're running in this space, you've taken care of a lot of the, the things with technical debt. You're, you're addressing and, and doing full automation. You're really kind of moving into a space of my application uh, is ready to fail over at any, any moment, right? And this could be in that space where you're thinking about, um, you know, well beyond just the, the types of disasters you would be thinking about. You're moving into a business continuity space and you're really setting up your business for success regardless of what happens to either your, your on-prem or AWS resources. With that, you can kind of see well, the costs uh, again as we kind of move in. Now you're running multiple uh, web servers and, and the costs, aren't, they don't change much, right? Um, the, the costs for this simple application and scenario, they won't change much. This would depend obviously upon what percentage of load you're doing. If you have resources that are, uh, you have more resources on-prem than you do in AWS, you know, you could obviously reduce or save costs. Or if you, you know, have a, a bursty uh, type of workload and you don't have the ability to scale up in that side, this is one of the benefits of the multi-site where you could have Amazon Web Services infrastructure take over uh, the majority of the load for an application if you have a very bursty type application or some type of event uh, or, or based on a calendar like a holiday type event. All right, so that's kind of our warm standby and multi-site options. Um, one thing I want to just clarify is you really need to be looking to our partner ecosystem um, to leverage as you ascend these levels of, of disaster recovery. Um, while you can do a lot of things in the backup and restore space on your own with many of the vendors and technologies that you have today, as you start moving into these pilot light, warm standby and multi-site scenarios, um, we have a great partner ecosystem to really help you reduce and remove technical debt. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned, this is, uh, will be on the higher the space of higher costs, but um, you can do a lot of things in, in automation that will uh, ultimately, in time, uh, end up paying for themselves, right? So, a couple of the lessons learned. Um, if you are investigating and looking at a third-party solution like the Cloud Endure or Racimi or those kinds of things, I've heard varying, um, or varying stances on the technologies and opinions of how they work. I would personally investigate them for your business and use case. I wouldn't trust the, the word or recommendation of another individual. I wouldn't go out into a space and be like, this is what so-and-so uses and so it's going to work great for me. Uh, I, I would do the investigation, do the due diligence, find out which solution is going to work best for you. Uh, I've already mentioned the partner engagement, but they can help you with these things and, and help you move through this space. Um, this is a great opportunity um, to reduce and remove technical debt uh, in the presentation, um, in, in some of the presentations earlier, talked about you know, the, the technical debt and, and really removing that as you move into AWS. Um, so that's one of those things. I would look at, at other customers' experiences and, and start with that. That's one of the reasons why I mentioned start um, with something small and ascend up those levels of, of DR um, because in, in most cases, customers will, in theory, they want to go out and do multi-site out of the gate, um, which is not a bad thing. That's not, you know, that kind of zeal and, and that is a great thing to have in, inside of you and, and in the individuals of your organization. But I would just say temper that and, and start ascending the level. The difference in work from your pilot light uh, pilot light work can build on to warm standby. Warm standby work can build on to multi-site. You're not losing anything. And so if you were to do that in a very sprint-like model, uh, you could break those out and say, I'm going to go pilot light um, DR in you know, these next few sprints. And then after that, I'm going to move forward and we're going to do warm standby. And then eventually, you know, we hope to get to the, um, the multi-site run. Okay. 
So with that, um, another uh, shout out. These are some of the partners that we have available to help in this space. Um, and and there's, there's lots and lots of assistance uh, in this area. So if you have questions, many of these guys are here, uh, including uh, one that we're going to have come up here in just a second, and uh, I'm going to have him introduce himself. We have uh, Patrick McClory from Dual Spark, uh, who's here, and Patrick is going to help us um, uh, kind of introduce what we're going to be doing for this uh, giveaway, uh, and then also just kind of quickly introduce himself, and then we're going to introduce and bring up uh, the rest of our panel. We're going to do an open panel, um, so more questions. Be thinking about them. Have them ready to go. Um, I want to have a, an open discussion. I found that, that panels are some of my favorite parts of, of any presentation. So get your questions ready um, and qualify for that $1,000 giveaway. Thanks. Cool. So hi, my name is Patrick McClory. I'm CTO and CEO of DualSpark. We're an advanced consulting partner of Amazon's. We specialize in um, kind of the hard problems. So Rich is talking about DR being a, to paraphrase, a deeply personal issue for organizations as you work through how to apply these strategies to your, uh, your needs. Uh, you know, our organization, especially in uh, the DR world, uh, we do a lot of engagements where we help customers through their, the process of understanding what's the right fit, what tools to put in place, uh, both strategically and from an architecture perspective, but then also help on the engineering side as well to, to address some of that technical debt issue. Um, so the, the detail, uh, quite simply, is that uh, Amazon has graciously um, kind of handed up a $1,000 service credit, and, and my team is going to pair that up with uh, a, a health check engagement to kind of give some guidance and, and architecture uh, information and kind of do a discovery assessment with you guys if you're interested and take that into a uh, sort of a work plan that would help you guys move forward with uh, a DR strategy with that uh, $1,000 uh, service credit. So that's the, uh, the giveaway, and obviously we'd love your questions, and, and the, the deal is once you guys ask questions after the, um, after the session, please come up and uh, come find me. Would love to grab your information, and uh, we've got one of those to give away, and we'll, we'll work on, uh, you know, at least one of those to give away, and we'll work on, on uh, the details of that um, for those who are interested. So. Cool. Thank you. So you do have to ask a question to qualify, um, and that's, that's part of the incentive. I do have some other questions that we can ask. So if you're interested in asking a question about your scenario, uh, about disaster recovery in general, about any of the slides, the technologies that are involved here, please take a, a line uh, in the queue of the microphones. And then while we're doing that, I will get um, the rest of our panel up here and uh, introduce them. So we have uh, Miha. Miha, if you could stand up and uh, come join us on stage, that would be great. Let's give Miha a round of applause, as well as everyone else that's going to come join us on this panel. All right, uh, and let's uh, have uh, Paul. Paul, do you want to come up and, and join us? Paul Now, uh, who is a consultant with our professional services. A senior consultant. I'm sorry about that, Paul. Forgive me. Okay. All right, do we have someone who's willing to uh, start up with the first question? All right, excellent. Thanks a lot for the talk, uh, Ilya uh, from in Airline Technology. Uh, yeah, first I saw the multi multi site uh, uh, disaster recovery scenario and said, why would you keep on premise data center in that scenario if you already build it in Amazon? So, uh, what are, uh, when, we, when we are building multi site uh, scenarios, there are often challenges in how you do you know, multi master replication for data if you want you know, every site to be able to process every request without sharding data, that's pretty hard. So I, maybe you can describe some of the tools that you can use, some of the technologies that you can use that enable that kind of, uh, you know, replication. Uh, you know, databases, storage, okay. and uh, uh, both Amazon to Amazon. I mean, I think it would also be uh, important, but also uh, on-premise to Amazon and back. Okay, we'll start with uh, Patrick then. Do you want to answer that question or? Yeah, the data layer, there's a number of different tools. Um, I hate to, to bring up Oracle, but they've got a great uh, partner landscape and tool set around uh, Golden Gate. So uh, just to allow you know, multi-master configurations, there's clearly a lot of tools in the marketplace, even partners of Amazon that, um, that are specific to MySQL and Postgres and other, other database solutions that you might be using. So on the data layer, um, Generally, I find the, the teams that I work with looking towards those tools to find uh, plugins or um, management frameworks on top of the built-in tool sets uh, for each of those database engines to enable master master. Um, but to, to Rich's point, a lot of it has to do with um, bandwidth. So a lot of it is very specific to uh, and very you know, sensitive to that direct connect being in place. So. Um, you know, making sure that you get the right size direct connect for your, your data needs uh, across that pipe is absolutely critical. 
uh, above and beyond even the tooling. Um, you know, there's a, a ton of automation around uh, whether you're using Puppet or Chef or, or other tools to, to deal with the, even the configuration across nodes where they sync and source data from. Um, I've used some, you know, some service solutions that are maybe Git focused that, that pull their repository and data, even config data from Git. So doing you know, multi-site Git repositories uh, has been uh, you know, very interesting, I'll put it that way, to, to manage uh, between Amazon and a private data center. Um, but Route 53 is also a really great tool to be able to use consistent naming, but in one data center and another, direct it to different resources that are synchronized is, is critical, especially to kind of simplify that configuration across data centers. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Let's, uh, next question. Yeah, my question is around, um, we're, my organization is uh, new to Am uh, Amazon Web Services. And we are launching a new, uh, two new, well, we already have the platforms online with, with our current server structure. And we're looking to integrate it with AWS in two different regions, one in Africa, one here in the United States. And I was kind of wondering, because we're new to it, what, what would be the best strategy for us, uh, considering we're going to be uh, doing multiple um, educational type delivery content mm -hmm. uh, that can help prepare us to have the right dis disaster recovery strategy in place, uh, considering that we're a new small startup, but we've got some you know, partnerships with some government agencies that are going to allow us to, to be in two locations when we launch in September. Okay, excellent. Thank you for a great question, Mihan or Paul, which, go ahead, Mihan. Sure. If I understand you correctly, you are actually looking to use cloud, just mostly what Rich was talking today, for primarily disaster recovery purposes. No, not just so, recovery. in your case, if you are looking a kind of a, a global type of a solution, probably, and I hope that I'm speaking for any of us architects here uh, uh, on the stage, you should actually do the cloud native solution because it's really hard to achieve a very good patterns that would allow you, you are having a global reach, which means that any type of replication across European uh, region and any of US regions, we are not talking about uh, sub, you know, sub 10 millisecond latency. So because of latency, any real-time replication becomes quite an issue for a data. So you're looking probably for eventual consistency. Um, if you are having a kind of a heavy business critical, mission critical workloads, that's not good enough. So deciding, biting a bullet, deciding to start with a cloud first is probably one of the viable options. If that is not possible, you would need to declare which of your regions is primary region to replicate with, create a direct connect link with over it, and then the other region, which let's say would be Europe, then kind of decide how are you going to actually use that replication between these two regions to replicate the data. But one of these can become a real-time replication, the other one will probably have a little bit of an issue. Excellent. Minor thing to add, actually. And this, this isn't strictly a DR strategy, necessarily, but you, know, you can get a lot of bang for your buck out of something like uh, CloudFront. You know, looking at a CDN, even caching small amounts of time, um, but if I heard you correctly, you were talking about an educational product? Yeah, two, two online platforms. So the content that you're serving, in many ways, technically doesn't, you know, there's likely a chunk, a good chunk of that that could be publicly available and well cached. So availability of, a partial availability of the site could be um, preserved if you chose a lower level of DR, you know, you know, a lower kind of cost approach that had a higher RTO or RPO. Um, but it, it's not, like I said, not strictly DR, but incorporating some of that CDN might be helpful as well. Excellent. I'm gonna, can we move to the next question? And Just you, okay, all right. So on that, uh, if you're hosting it in another region, uh, check out your regulatory compliance. You may not be able to export that data outside that region. So that's one thing that you definitely need to be careful about if you're doing global type uh, disaster recovery or backup is it might have to reside in that region just due to safe harbor. Yep, safe harbor. Okay, excellent. All right, next question. Uh, I hope it's the right audience. Uh, my name is Alex from Ancestry.com. Um, what are the general recommendations around disaster recovery and protection against uh, denial of service attack? like massive distributed denial for service attack. Good, good question. Paul, do you have any thoughts on that or? Sure. So uh, 
Denial of service is actually handled as one of the fundamental things by Amazon on the back end. So we actually take care of the denial of service attacks that are coming into Amazon and AWS. Uh, if you do note that you are having a denial of service attack that is directed specifically at you and we haven't picked it up, definitely reach out to support. They're going to be the people that are going to help you uh, mitigate that as fast as possible. So that's just something that uh, you as a customer, if you identify it, if you even think that you're under a denial of service attack, open up a support case. They will take that as high priority and they'll actually work with you to uh, mitigate that on the back end and actually black hole the traffic for you. Well, that's a part of the shared security, shared responsibility. Yeah. And where, the, where would they find that? Yeah, so the, the shared uh, security responsibility model is actually going to be on our security uh, portion of the website. So if you go to aws.amazon.com slash security, uh, it'll actually have it in there along with the security uh, resources white paper that actually talks about the whole shared security model on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, Miro. I'm a customer from Encore Capital Group. Um, on one of the slides, I saw that uh, you guys are suggesting to use uh, Storage Gateway, either Amazon or third party, that you can, you can put on-prem and then the data goes through that Storage Gateway to S3 and then there was a link to go down to Glacier. Correct. Now, my understanding is that if the volume is actually controlled from the storage gateway, you can't apply the life policy um, that, that's usually available for objects that are natively stored to the S3. And I'll give you my use case. My use case is I want the data that sits in the cache volume to stay there for two months. Um, then, obviously, it's stored at S3. Then it should stay at S3 for another probably year or two and then for compliance reasons, I just wanted to tear down to the cheapest available storage, and I know that after two years, we probably won't touch it. Right. But I'm that's not available today, my understanding at least. Do you want me to take that? Sure. Okay. So looking at it from the uh, storage gateway product on the VTL, on the back end, the only way to guarantee that your cache is not overwritten is to have a cache that's large enough to actually support that on the back end. So there's nothing that says that we can guarantee that your cache won't be overwritten or drained out of the, the right section of it on the cache. Does that make sense? And I'm not looking into the VTL use case at all. So You're just looking in the cache, cache volumes. volumes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and is this available today or not? Yeah, so from a cache uh, volume, you can't actually specify what remains in cache. It's actually going to be, if you utilize all of the cache, it'll overwrite it. That, and that's okay. Yeah. It will go to S3, but can I apply a lifecycle policy on S3 to tear that data down to Glacier if it has been ingested through the gateway? Okay, so not the VTL solution, but just not the, the VTL, just cache, cache volumes. volumes. You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Because yeah. that, that's what's shown there, yeah, right? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to follow up if uh, you, you can uh, provide okay. me with your contact info. The other thing is if we don't, um, I'd also be happy to get you uh, or take the information back and put the use case in and, and submit it as a feature request for, for the storage gateway. So, Thank you. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Okay, uh, next question. We, uh, I think we're still good on time, so yes. Hi. Um, our DR use case has a couple challenges. One is um, fairly large volume, 800 terabytes. Mm. Second is um, our application uses all SIF shares, mm. which don't really exist in Amazon. What would you recommend to, to you know, replicate that over, but then also to represent that same volume as SIF shares? Yeah, let's let Patrick. So can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, in terms of how your application or the, the underlying solution is using the SIF share, does it require the SIFS binding, or is it simply act? Is it well? First of all, Windows or Linux is the easy question. Uh, mostly Windows. Okay. And are you requiring the SIFS binding, or is it simply the one you're using right now? Could you could you move to a different uh, configuration? Uh, eventually, we want to move directly to S3, but it's sort of the legacy problem right now. Okay. So there's a couple of good solutions out there um, in terms of keeping a Windows native world, uh, DFS, uh, distributed file system in uh, AWS run on Windows is actually quite interesting. Um, I believe the professional services team has either a white paper or some information on that. Um, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll work with Paul if, if you're interested in finding it. Um, I, I remember seeing something at one point. And that's on top of EBS, not S3, right? So that would be on top of EBS for the short term. Uh, but that would give you a, a highly distributed cloud safe um, 
binding to share storage. So that way you're not having a, a single point of failure sort of SIF share sitting out in the world. Uh, alternatively, there are some great partners out there. SoftNAS is one of them. Uh, I'm not sure what their storage um, size is, but I know they have a booth over in the, the expo hall. Uh, I would definitely be worth talking to, to those guys to see what the, the size of it is. But then the, the SIFS binding and the, the size of that volume and management of it and availability becomes uh, a part of that SaaS offering. So there's, there's both a SaaS and a, a Windows native way for you to do it yourself. And then, you know, again, as you transition that to S3, um, you, you could you know, move from DFS or SoftNAS straight to S3 with a, a copy job. Uh, over the course of time if needed. Okay, thank you. Actually, if you want to save a lot of money on that and you're going to do DFS, uh, look at our storage class uh, instances. Mm -hmm. um, they're basically going to save you a factor in magnitude on the cost on the back end. Uh, with DFS, it's going to be replicated uh, multi times over that. So uh, you're going to get about 48 terabytes of local instance storage uh, in those classes that you don't have to pay for. EBS volumes would be uh, relatively expensive compared to that. So that might be something that you want to look at also as another opportunity. Let me throw something, just, just to make sure I clarify. So that's a, uh, an amazing idea, and the D2s were just released uh, two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and if you're building a distributed file system and you're replicating, the failure of one instance, and if you plan your instance layout, um, as long as you bring it back up and it re-replicates properly and you've automated that, it's actually you know, something you can mitigate from a risk perspective, so. And then snap that to S3 then? Snap to S3, you know, keep a, a running copy, uh, you know, use uh, some of the hooks and eventing inside of DFS to copy back and forth to S3. Um, there's a lot of really intricate stuff you can do with that. And sorry, last follow up, the, the storage gateways, can they be used within Amazon to yeah. solve this? I know yes. there's yeah. limits, but. Yes, they can. Yes, they have 150 terabyte of Sorry, each uh, storage gateway has a 150 terabyte limit on it, so you would have to deploy multiple uh, storage gateway devices in that uh, respect to actually get up to your 100 or 800 terabyte, as I heard it, uh, on the back end. Okay. Uh, I would also recommend that you go to the keynote tomorrow. So yes, <laughs> go to the keynote. <laughs> Great, thank you guys. Attend the keynote. That, that's not a, a hint of any, nope. no. Okay. <laughs> Hey, uh, I also have a question um, related to um, DR, and um, through the course of the day, I've heard several times that DR sites have failed, uh, not because they were not available or there was a problem with it, but m because they were outdated. So my question is uh, partly, um, how do I basically make sure that all my changes that go into production are also reflected in my DR site? And I, there's, there's different types of changes. There is like, and we're just doing enterprise size migration right now and have like all these legacy systems and a lot of legacy processes where people go in, do manual changes, and on top of that there is a, a current state of the environment where maybe I have so many, I have some scaling option and I have so many uh, types of a particular server and I, I need to make sure to replicate that to DR and not everything is H, HA and not everything is um, uh, a, a hot uh, uh, or warm standby site. I, I, I basically want to be able to recreate it in DR in a matter of like whatever, six hours right. or so. Right, so what you're looking for is actually a very interesting and important use case that you want to, in case of a real total disaster, either because of a data corruption or you have intrusion or maybe a natural disaster, you want to rehydrate your whole environment from very much nothing up. Right, including um, the AWS console and, and all the correct the configuration. Yes, uh, today the integrated rehydration. That first there would be ability that goes and scans all of your infrastructure and captures it into kind of a JSON object, stores that object somewhere, which would be kind of a, almost like a script for a cloud formation rehydration. That would be awesome service. We don't have it today, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> May, yeah, that one is not for a keynote tomorrow. <laughs> uh, definitely, this is one part that when you are looking from a good, better, best, the good part is as you create your migration strategy, you need to have a checkpoint somewhere where operations actually declares before you move the workload into a production AWS environment, how do you do the proper regular snapshotting, proper data capturing, and also, don't forget, testing. So how do you make sure that you are not doing just the backup, that you can, you can actually do the restore? 
better one is that you have a regular fault injections on purpose in AWS. So instead of kind of a hoping and protecting that AWS will run forever and nothing will ever go wrong, you know, that kind of a hope and face goes very short. That's why it's much better that operations start to flip over things on purpose and see that your DR, ideally, that you have a proper failing over to another availability zone, failing over to another node, failing over maybe to another region. And also, if you're failing a database, how will the rest of the systems recover and fail to another, to the, to the failover node on a database layer? The best one, you actually want to have the continuous integration and continuous pipeline of the services that kind of starts to self-detect. They will reroute whenever there is a failure in the constellation. They reroute around the failure, but they also need to start auto-rebuilding. So think about it that on a best level of scenario, when you move fully to the cloud, whenever you ask a developer to write a new microservice or SOA level of a service, that developer also needs to have all of the triggers, how to detect that the service is sick, how do you kill it, how do you recreate yourself? So that becomes, a, it's almost like a modern install part. If you remember in the old world, the installer took like 20% of the time to write the actual thing in the installer package. Now think about that, that you need to do the health detection and recreation of the sick instance or a sick service in the same rigorous fashion, because that goes into the uh, HADR scenario as well. So it kind of I told you from a minimum to the best how, how, to, how to cover it. Mm -hmm. All right, I th should we go to the next question? I think we're almost out of time, so I want to get that Last question, okay. Okay, well, what I'm taking away from this is strict change uh, management, change control, and then also like capture these things and, and basically do every, every change through code and make sure you can read. And I think that's the key. The, you said a really scary buzzword in there that people are making, or you know, concept that people are making changes manually, and you've gotta get your team really disciplined to using a tool or a, a framework that you, know, you make the change in the repo and that's what publishes. So that not only do you get the audit, but you get the central point of truth for that config. Yeah, first measure was to lock them out of AWS console. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Actually, the usual the policy would be don't let human hands touch production systems. Yeah. It's as easy as that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The last one. Yes, please. Um, um, assuming that cloud is all about taking humans out of the sort of technology <laughs> kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, what are the tools out there or any startups you guys have seen which are helping in reducing the, the amount of traffic which goes over the network in the DR scenarios, right? It, it, it can be policy-based computing or what needs to be shipped uh, to the DR side and how often and stuff like that. Have you guys seen any uh, new technologies emerging? That's sort of a very open, vague question to you guys. So Riverbed released their Whitewater product uh, in 2012. Um, and it's more of a dedupe. So we're seeing a lot of, I mean, at least I'm seeing a lot of use of dedupe to, uh, technologies to reduce the, you know, the bandwidth overhead, uh, WAN acceleration is another easy one. Um, I don't know that I've seen any that are policy-based DR sort of ship or end-to-end -end or endpoint sort of mappings. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's enough smart people in here. Someone could start a new company tomorrow, but, um, you know, I think there's there's plenty of good ideas out there, and that's one area that, at least for now, I, my experience has been it's been a really kind of personal company decision uh, as to what they ship and how, and getting the the permutations down to a product level is is pretty difficult. Yeah, so it would just come down to dedupe, and if you believe in UDP flooding of your network on the back end, so you might be looking at something like a dedupe and then also using an Aspera product on top of that and maximizing your bandwidth that you have out there. So you're not gonna incur the retransmits of the TPC or TCP stack on the back end, so you're gonna actually get 20 plus percent better utilization out of your pipe. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, another question, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is uh, how far away are we gearing towards uh, uh, fully automatic real-time disaster recovery. I have a client right now that fails over immediately uh, using Route 53 and, uh, and their data centers 
uh, on the West Coast, uh, US West 2 and US East 1. So um, it's totally achievable. It's just a matter of how much work you put into the, the inner workings of making that happen. Yeah. You're also starting to see services like the auto recovery on EC2 and that kind of stuff. So you're starting to see Amazon enter that space. Um, so I'm, I'd be speculating if I were to guess on, on how far away we are, but you're seeing that trend move yeah, into yeah. that auto recovery But uh, I'm particularly focused on real time. Right. It's, it's not a non-real time, of course. You know, a lot of higher everybody, definitely uh, fully automatic. Is it, it's not only possible, it's already existing. I'm talking about real time, especially different, uh, every, different Amazon which is far away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Different contents or things like well, that. Well, It'd be real very time is the multi-site, right? That's yeah. that's really the direction you're going, where you have a failover, but nobody knows anything about it, right? That's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. so it exists today to to answer your question, but you need to be running in these these multi-site configurations where you you have multiple regions and availability zones and, and are highly distributed. So. The answer to that question is today. So one of those patterns would be that you start to go for, to at least two or maybe three regions. You grab at least two, maybe three availability zones per region. And whenever you load them, you need to make sure that you don't, you actually pre-reserve, let's say you go with the reserved instances, but you never fill them up more than two thirds if you're going with a three by three pattern. So you kind of think about, you have a nine availability zones now in all those nine availability zones are kind of a two-thirds full. So whenever you need to do the recovery of disaster, either uh, AZ or a region, the other two can easily take over the load. It looks right. like uh, similar to uh, what uh, Cassandra does. It's still, it's eventual consistency. There's no real... Well, now Cassandra is the similar. persistency storage layer that yeah. can be used in that constellation. That have similar inner, model. Inner rings and outer rings. Yeah. But yeah, we are talking primarily also for the actual compute. You can also do the same pattern for the caching layer, mm -hmm. right? You can use the same pattern for the queuing in between those. So you are bringing out a good point best cloud-based architectures are always based on the eventual consistency because patterns are showing that you will scale your application way easier. You can always treat certain portions of your transactions and play with the two-phase commits and actually have a hard consistency. But for hard consistency across regions, you need to implement a two-phase commit, which is, I mean, the pattern exists since IBM made it like 30 years ago but it's not trivial to implement. Right, excellent. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you. Oh, yes, if you don't mind approaching the mic quickly. You guys mentioned uh, Whitewater a couple times throughout the discussion today. I heard it mentioned earlier today. Uh, Whitewater was recently rebranded to Steel Store, yeah. and it's, I think, purchased, purchased by NetApp. Yeah. So, just a little note. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.